the references have the main references for the gifts of the Spirit, and those are Ro Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4. And so the references specifically for the different gifts, uh, I will just mention because we have already read those passages. But, um, but I want to uh, also refer to other passages of the scripture that, that relate to, uh, to some of these. The leadership, according to our notes here, uh, this aptitude marks a person who is able to stand before a church to direct the body with care and attention and to motivate them toward achieving the church's goals. Now this, you notice this does not specifically mention ministry. It could include ministry, but it's, it could also be other assistant activities. Uh, it could be pastor, assistant pastor, deacon, Sunday school director, a member of good standing in the faith, for example, the head deacon or a deacon that would perform the, um, the communion service, that sort of thing, a person of leadership in the church. Um, the, a missionary, an evangelist, uh, someone who's in a position of authority over some portion of the church and the service. Um, even at times, uh, Brother Jim has come forward to address the whole church in regard to the security in the, in the sanctuary area entrance back there, that sort of thing. That could be anyone who has any kind of authority in the church can speak to the church and lead the church in a particular area. Um, <clears throat> and so a member of good standing in the faith. Um, uh, there is a warning about being in uh, taking a stand like this. Um, and that is in Acts chapter 20. And we'll start reading at verse 26. Paul is addressing... Um, the people just before he is going to um, Rome to be tried and um, he's saying he probably will not see them again and he says he's talking about his ministry to them and how they've responded he says how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ and now behold I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem you know I, I just want to say about that he's going to Jerusalem to be probably executed he probably he knows he's probably going to be executed and he yet uses this because he he's not trying to hide from the, what the judgment of the law has been. He's not try, trying to escape that. He has surrendered himself. He's going in the spirit to Jerusalem to let things happen as they will. Um, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. And that's the same word about leadership there, overseers. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So he puts a challenge on church leaders to guard the flock, to preach the word, to not fail in the ministry, to continue in the faith and uh, abide in the spirit 
and and do the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a that's a challenge and a warning to anyone who's in church leadership. Do not stand up frivolously in front of the church and say things. Watch what you say. Watch what you do. People are watching every Christian, but especially someone who's willing to stand up and and do the ministry in front of others. So watch that. And there's also a warning of uh, for the members about being critical of the leaders. So that goes both ways. You know, if uh, we're supposed to serve one another and help one another and work together as a body. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are all about. And um, so just just saying a, a position of leadership comes with a warning. Also, leadership is included in the requirements for bishop and elder in First Timothy where uh, Paul was advising Timothy about being uh, a pastor or, or bishop um, or deacon, depending on the, the, the reference. And, um, and that is, and being a leader of the church, uh, the church and the home is part of being uh, the pastor or, or a leader. If you can't keep, the one passage says, if you can't keep your house in order, how can you keep the church in order? And um, I, w I won't dig that, I won't pick that bone apart. But, um, uh, and a reference in Acts 4, 8 is, is about that, that very thing. Let's see, we, we'll look at that. Acts 4, 8 says, Peter, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, we have, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he is made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So he is criticizing those who were elders of the synagogue because they were leading people astray. And they were telling people the wrong thing about Jesus Christ. And so that comes, that being in a position of leadership puts you in a spot. If you're leading, who are you following? If you're not following the Lord Jesus, then you don't need to be in a leadership position in the church. And so that, that being said, uh, we will go on to the the gift of the spirit that is mercy that is uh, referenced in Romans 12 8 and mercy is the defining trait of a person with great sensitivity for those who are suffering it manifests itself in offering compassion and encouragement and in a love for giving practical help to someone in need and um, Jesus was asked about that. It's like being a good neighbor. You know, Jesus said that that we he, we are to love our neighbors. And one, uh, a smart aleck that was in one of his, his um, where he was talking, asked him, well, you know, who's our neighbor? So this passage goes into that in detail, and then we'll see how it goes. It's Luke 10. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25. And it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Jesus said, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. 
And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him back, brought him to the inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, this is Jesus asking now, which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And the man answered, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Showing mercy, being not, you know, neighbor. Nowadays, neighbor means whoever lives right by you, next to you, across the street. Uh, that's not what neighbor is talking about. Neighbor is somebody you're standing beside in the grocery line. Neighbor is someone who, whom you pass when you're walking your dog just down the road. Or it's someone that you happen to maybe talk to on the phone. You don't even know where they are. But God has given you an opportunity to speak to this person. Can you take advantage of it um, and give a little gospel there? Um, a neighbor is someone that has crossed your path. And um, so being merciful to someone that we meet when we are at a restaurant, maybe you have a waiter or waitress that's just really distracted or uh, or not attended, or attentive, that, that kind of thing. You don't know what that person's been through. I don't know. I can't tell you how many times that I have heard testimony and, and seen um, in real life how a sensitive Christian has reached out to someone like that and come to find out they're about to lose their house or one of their children is really sick or th their husband's, you know, having trouble or, or something like that. And, and maybe you can help in that situation. Maybe all you can do is pray in that situation. Maybe you can give them a little money, but whatever when you're in that situation and you respond to the opportunity, God will, will impress on your heart what to do, what you can do. And, uh, and that's, be, that's having mercy. That's to, to have that mindset of being available. And all Christians have an, a measure of mercy because it is part of salvation. Um, Ephesians um, 2, 8, and 9 says that, um, that it's not by our uh, measure of righteousness, but it's by the mercy that God has given us, the gift of eternal life. And um, uh, I want to turn to James chapter 2 and read this reference about mercy. That's uh, James chapter 2, verse 13. Um, let, let's see, let's start with verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, for that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. This mercy and judgment are counterbalances. God is holy. God has given laws that guide the universe, not just human life, but everything, the planets. And these things, and we must follow God's law. 
but God has mercy. And we cannot really balance those two. God has both. And God, God is strong in his judgment, and he is firm in his judgment. But through prayer and repentance, somehow mercy brings us um, and the judgment together because Jesus paid the judgment. And so we can have mercy on other, other people because we have received mercy of God. So bear in mind, and you know, there's, there's uh, the passage about, um, let me see this. Uh, that might be where this is. I'm looking at, um, let's see. Hebrews 8.12. Let's see if this is what I'm trying to think of. Hebrews 8.12 is one book back from James. It says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will, not, will I remember no more. This is God's mercy to us. And uh, Titus 3.5. See if I can get there. to go through it. I memorized the Bible ver books when I was about nine years old, so every once in a while I have to go ding, 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 ding. Oh, Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So the mercy that God gives us, we share with others. And we can't not share the mercy of salvation, but we can share mercies in um, relationships and in physical needs and in spiritual needs even. We can, we can share what God has helped us with so that they obtain mercy. And I think this past Sunday we had some experience of that because... Um, um, Pastor Dave encouraged us to, to be empathetic toward others. And when we see someone who is struggling with a need, to go to them and pray, pray with them and offer, if we see them stumble, to offer assistance and, um, and encouragement. And um, uh, so mercy is something that, that all Christians have a measure of. Uh, but some people are extremely compassionate, and they 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 feel the need of others, and they're ready to to minister and seeking out people to minister to and to assist. That's mercy. And the next one in our study sheet is prophecy, and that's listed in Romans twelve six and in First Corinthians twelve ten. Prophecy is the ability to speak the message of God to others. This sometimes involves foresight or visions of what is to come. And this skill should only be used, should be used only, to offer encouragement or warning. Um, okay, so it's, it can be understanding difficult passages of scripture. It can be... Um, guiding the direction of, uh, of activity or uh, the body of Christ into some area of ministry. Um, the, there's a warning in 2 Peter 1 uh, for this one also. Let's see if we can go to that. 2 Peter. Second Peter. Let me find my notes. Chapter one, verses twenty and twenty-one. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture 
is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And what that, what that means. As Christians, we can read the, we can read the Bible. And every time we read, even if we read the same passage of scripture, we can read over and over and over. And many times when we read this, this passage of scripture that we've read many times, God will still show us something new. Because this is the living word of God. But when you hear someone expounding supposedly the word of God, and they are not following the rest of scripture because we're supposed to apply scripture to scripture not a single verse and base our whole doctrine on that single verse um, or not taking a verse out of context okay N but not a private interpretation specifically is talking about prophecy because people who claim who ha claim to have the gift of prophecy will sometimes say something that God has not told them. And that's a private interpretation. That's what this is talking about. We don't have private interpretation. That's why we have the whole Bible now. The Holy Spirit will enlighten us. There are times when, when over the years of studying the scripture, we will come across something that that shines a light on something that we've been a little dim about. There's passages all in the, in the Word that that uh, that maybe seem like the Holy Spirit and the Trinity was a mystery to believers in the Old Testament times. There are so there are many times when God speaks of Himself as more than one. There are times when. Um, in a in a passage of a, a blessing, it it will have three times repeated. God, the Lord God said this. The Lord God said this. The Lord God said this in this passage. But it's a different thing that God said, and it, but it was three times. So the, it was a mystery in the Old Testament, um, and and I want to talk about the Holy Spirit specifically in another lesson but um, but it was a mystery in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that is clarified by passages that talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit which you do not see in the Old Testament listed like that but now that we are in the church age we know God, men God the Father ministers in a way, God the Son ministers in a way and God the Holy Spirit ministers in a way and they have different areas of ministry that overlap and that influence us to do or not to do things. And so in, in, if prophecy is your ministry, beware that you do not say something that God has not told you to say. It's a solemn responsibility. And I'll end with Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Now, this is talking about the scripture, but the scripture is the basis for prophecy. God's enlightenment through the scripture is the basis for the prophecy. And so this says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The prophecy, yes, God, God gives the gift of prophecy to some and to all in a measure because the Holy Spirit enlightens us to what we read. And when we pray, God will show us things that maybe we've read in the past, but he will enlighten us. But before you say to people that God told you this, you make sure God told you. Back it up with scripture. 
Otherwise, um, there's, like I said, the, like the warning said, uh, God will hold you responsible. And, um, and it's your turn. <laughs>